to do that, and it saved, uh, I think his name was Spock, life. Uh, George Harrison, next to him, he didn't listen to me. I chewed him out three or four times about not flying over the target when he was flying my wing. Uh, and so one day I was on court martial and wasn't flying with him. He did. So he took a round in the knee and that was the end of his war. It sounds like you got court martial. You want to rephrase that? No. <laughs> that was somebody else. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, uh, that was a friend of mine. He was a slick pilot. And uh, he got a, he got hit in the rotor or tail rotor, and ended up going down the edge of a bomb crater. Otherwise, he probably wouldn't have lived to talk about it. Uh, he stayed in the service, made brigadier general. But he told me after that, he said, "They tell you how to fly this thing without a tail rotor. Don't believe them. They don't fly. <laughs> they just crash." So. When you talk about a slick, that's a, a Huey? A slick is a troop carrier. Yeah, it doesn't have the many guns or the rockets or any of that, so it's pretty much better in the back except for the door gunner. That's what I do, the slick. Yeah. How it it was a utility. Pardon? I'm sorry, how many people did you carry? Were you able to help carry? Well, we, uh, I had a co-pilot, and I was in the lead ship, and a door gunner and a crew chief. Those guys were hard working, and uh, in my case, they really risked it. They'd step out on the skid in flight and hang with a bungee cord and fire that M60 right down to cover our brakes. They were tough, they were good, they were motivated, and when we landed, they'd have to put tapes over the bullet holes. We just used OD tape to cover bullet holes that didn't hit anything else. And uh, of course, the crew chief had to do the daily maintenance on it. So they weren't done when we landed a lot of times. What are we looking at here? Oh, this is an accident. <laughs> uh, they uh, popped the flare on board the helicopter, which is a very dangerous situation. And I, I think that's fire extinguisher for falling your sitting yeah. there. So, what did you use flares for on the helicopters? Well, we we, uh, we had flare duty at night. We flew. <coughs> the VC liked to attack at night because our Air Force couldn't really perform that well uh, because of the danger of hitting hitting troops. Uh, but we were we were out there. I mean, they they called us day and night. And one of the jobs we had was dropping flares. Thank you. Shorty. Oh, I want to mention, by the way, that Dave is the author of an excellent book about his experience in Vietnam, and we have a big pile of them. I'm sure he'll be happy to autograph them for you. Shorty, maybe you can introduce yourself. And uh, I'm Shorty Olson. I was uh, almost pre-Vietnam. I was. Uh, went in in January of 1959, so they just had uh, uh, advisors in Vietnam at that time, but I ended up at Tachikawa Air Base in Japan after a boot camp and tech school at Wichita Falls, Texas, and uh, it was a uh, MATS outfit, military after transport service, and in the we had about uh, 24 C-124s in the unit. And then I also worked on transit maintenance when planes would come in from the states, uh, C-118, C-121s, all the old reset planes before jets. Mm -hmm. uh, what airplane is this? This like after four or 500 hours, they would take them in and do major maintenance on them. And then, uh, I was just involved mainly on the flight line and whenever it would come in if the flight engineer or the pilot or the co pilot would put a write up in the in the uh, ball book that was something that wasn't operating right, that was our job to fix it and get it ready to go back out. Uh, 
we primarily uh, helped the troops in Korea. We ran shuttles to Korea every day. And uh, we worked 12 hour shifts, 12 hours on, 12 hours on, off, 12 hours on, and then we had two days off. So we work a month of days, the next month we work nights. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed my trip over there. Uh, as a matter of fact, my own, some of, I know a lot of you here know my uncle Cecil Brown that mm -hmm. has passed away. But that same base is where he ended up at the end of World War II. Oh, so that was kind of ironic. Yeah. <laughs> Why do they call you Shorty? <laughs> <laughs> because until I was a senior in high school, I was the littlest kid in my class. I was five foot one when I finished my junior year of high school. <laughs> I picked up the name Bill. early on. <laughs> <laughs> Phil Rival. That's well, you, I hope. Yes, it is. <laughs> but that's actually a, a National Guard picture because I can tell from the Velcro on the helmet. Mm -hmm. We had to have those for night vision goggles. So, but there's some in there kind of like that from Vietnam. This is after Vietnam, then, is it? Yeah. And uh, and, and I should say, this this uniform, we didn't have anything like this in Vietnam. We all wore jungle fatigues as pilots and infantry, whatever. And but uh, when I retired from National Guard after 31 years total service, then. That's what I was, well, this is what I was. So, but that's probably close. Yeah, I do want to say, though, uh, Chick is my brother-in-law and Anne, my wife of 53 years. <laughs> She's heard all the war stories. <laughs> 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 and probably could correct me if I could get something. <laughs> Never. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's a Huey picture. I would say that's, a, you know, when I was in the National Guard sometime. I don't know well, it's got to be late. It had wire cutters on it. So we didn't oh. have wire cutters in Vietnam. What are the wire cutters? That's this piece up here. Thing? There's one at the bottom and one at the top. Oh. So if you happen to hit a power line, uh, the wire will come in here. And it feeds down, and there's a bracy thing up to cut the wire. Because mm -hmm. wi wires bring down a lot of helicopters. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when I worked for uh, Airbac later on, a lot of night work and landing on the roads, and, and all roads have wires going down. So mm -hmm. It's really bad at night. Uh, that is from Vietnam. And Chick showed you that picture of the, called it the Loach, which was the scout aircraft. Well, when I was there a couple of years earlier, I think, uh, th this was the scout aircraft. And you, you can't see much of it, but if you remember the MASH TV program, well, this is a later version in that it had a turbocharged engine. But basically, we had a single pilot and a single gunner with the M60 machine gun, the old, not the most modern. And so our job, we, and we always flew two together, so you had the lead and, and then you had the wingman. And the wingman's job, even back then, was to, when, when the lead got shot at, then the wingman was supposed to swing in and you, shoot, you were what, the, what Chick described as the fishing lure. So to speak, you were trying to. Uh, you tended to get, even though there's not much there to put a bullet, bullet hole in, you tended to get more than a Huey, and more frequently too. But, uh, anyway, uh, so that that's what I flew for quite a, I think 500 and some hours out of 12. There's one more photo. Is that you? That that is me. Uh, I think I think that's uh, when I got my second uh, distinguished flying cross, and that was in Vietnam. I got the third one in Germany. You know, because it takes a while for ketchup. 
So, well, thank you. Uh, now's the best time, of course, you guys, any of you get to ask questions, if there are any questions here, that is. I have a few questions of my own. I'm not texting, I'm just uh, <laughs> in my notes here. I was uh, hoping to ask each one of you pretty quickly how you ended up flying helicopters or how you ended up working on, uh, is, was that by choice? Was that, uh, how did you end up there? I don't know, you can go in any order you want. I was a commission officer in armor and I got to thinking that, you know, I'm going to Nam and them tanks are going to be awful hot over there <laughs> for uh, aviation. <laughs> Phil got back, like you said, two years before I went, got over there, so when you were raised, you could put cutter and all that sort of stuff to get married. Anyway, <laughs> what is it? But, but, uh, I thought that was a pretty good idea. I'm clumsy, and I and I realized, man, I, if I'm going to walk through the jungle, I'll blow my leg off. So I, I went up and interviewed for the, the one to flight school, and they took me. <laughs> That's how I ended up flying. So I never wanted to be a helicopter. Yeah. You wanted to get into jets and... Oh yeah, I would have. I mean, I wouldn't have volunteered to do anything, but it was uh, <laughs> infantry or helicopters is what it came down to. Yeah. It was an easy decision. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to fly from, a, from an early age. Uh, one of my uncles served in the Korean War, and by the way, Grandpa in World War One and Dad in World War Two, but uh, he got me a pair of Navy aviator goggles. And, uh, kind of like Chick, I I had dreams of jets, you know, and uh, I was ready to take on the Chinese wherever they were. But uh, <laughs> that didn't work out too good in Army ROTC. But I did find out that they give me 40 hours in a Cessna 150 if I pass the flight physical and sign up for advanced ROTC. So I did that, and then I was pretty well committed to flight school, either fixed wing or rotary. And uh, I don't know, I, I could have waited for fixed wing, but I was just kind of chilling at Fort Gordon, running a company, uh, and I wanted to get it over with, so I signed up for helicopters. But I wanted to add one thing too. We were in support of the ground troops. Uh, we we didn't really shoot very much unless we were told to and where. And so our job was to make the lives of the ground troops as good as we could. And we loved those guys. We could hear their the fear in their voices on the radio. But I, I did some things last night. I went to the Congressional Medals of Honor in Vietnam and in World War II. We had 63 in Vietnam that dove on hand grenades or explosives to save the buddies. There were 27 in World War II in both theaters of the war. So we didn't, we didn't know much about love and didn't feel much back at home, but we loved one another. That's true of Vietnam veterans. Well, um, well, I should say something too before I get off on mine, but uh, that's the purpose of the scouts as well. We, the, the purpose of the, having the scouts out there at all is because the snipers or whatever is keeping the ground troops from moving. So when that happens, then they call us and we go out and try to find them. Eliminate them, I guess that's the term. <coughs> you know, we didn't call it kill them. Yeah. Yeah. You literally went looking for them in trees and buildings. Is that how, how it worked? Well, yeah. I, I never I never saw a sniper in a tree, except a hollowed out tree once. Mm -hmm. we, we could see him from the air by looking down. Mm -hmm. the, the scouts always flew. Uh, like the height of the ceiling of the trees. We never, 
We used to say we'd get nosebleeds if we went 50 feet in the air. But, you know, so that was, that's what we did. It's all in support of the ground troops. So, but uh, the reason I joined, because I got a draft notice. <laughs> Back in 1965 or, anyway, I went in in 66. So, they were looking for some helicopter pilots at the time, so I ended, that's how I ended up there. Were you predisposed to flying? Did you have any interest in, in that? No, I was going to be a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> Shorty, how did you become a mechanic? Well, I was born raised on a farm, and my dad did a lot of his own maintenance on the, all of his farm equipment, tractors and combines and so forth. And it seemed like we overhauled the tractor at least every winter. We was overhauling somebody's tractor. So uh, I learned a lot about engines at that time. So when I took some of the tests after I got to boot camp for them to decide what I was going to go into, I, uh, I guess the tests that I took showed that I was mechanically inclined, so I got sent to Wichita Falls to tech school to become an aircraft mechanic. And, uh, and of course, there you get to put in, if you're going to get sent overseas, where would, what's your first choice? And uh, of course, I put in Germany, so they sent me to Japan, <laughs> which is typical, I guess. But uh, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed what I did. Really enjoyed working on aircraft. Actually, I was offered if I would have re up for another four years, they were going to send me to flight engineer school and I was going to start flying. But it uh, seemed to me like all the mechanics that were in uh, down at Scott Field, I was in an air back outfit down there. And uh, the any flight engineers down there were getting sent to Vietnam. Didn't really have a desire to go to Vietnam, so I finished my four years and went back to the farm. Any questions out there? Yeah? So most of you served in the Army. Yeah, Short of you were in the Air, Air Force. Force. <clears throat> okay, you were just a branch of the Army Air Guard or Army Air Force? Well, it's just Army Aviation. Army Aviation. What do you think of the, I know this has to interest you a lot, the new <coughs> helicopters today that they use in war like the Apache? Pretty impressive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'd love to get my hands on Especially if you run around at night when the bad guys can't see you. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good deal. And they will, uh, also now they will fly themselves. Oh, you can see it now, too. <laughs> Did yeah. you have any night vision equipment in Vietnam? No. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to not turn on any white lights. It was all red lights to keep our night vision. But yeah, we had to, because smoke didn't work, you had to look for a little strobe light as to where the friendlies were and to take your direction from that and uh, it was kind of nerve-wracking and thank god i never put any rockets on friendly troops but there was a real danger of doing that and uh, you had to really be careful and pay attention to what you were doing so you had a how long was your flight training one year one year yeah. i only got nine months but you did I need more help. <laughs> <laughs> At that time, they didn't need any more infantry guys, so they kept me in. <laughs> so how did the training work? Did you have to go through several stages? How, how did that work? Yeah, we started in Fort Walters, Texas back then. And uh, they call it primary. Uh, Everybody remembers the first time they hovered because uh, the instructor would get you in a 
and a hover, which is supposed to be three feet off the ground and uh, stationary. And then he'd give you the helicopter and you would begin careening back and forth, <laughs> up and down. And it varied, but 30 minutes to 45, somewhere in that range, it all just kind of came together and locked in. But by then you had sweat pouring <laughs> down your face and you were ready to take a bath. <laughs> and they did throw us in the, in the pool at uh, the restaurant, behind the restaurant, after we soloed. But uh, you get through solo, and that, that's a big step. And then they just continued to increase your training, you get auto rotations, which means you're landing without power. Uh, chime in, Skip. I'm, I'm kind of out of ideas. Well, we had Walters who did the primary small aircraft uh, yeah. and then went to Rucker or Savannah and we did instrument training and then tactical training and then it was over. Yeah. Did you learn to fly fixed wing? No. No. Straight to helicopters. Yeah. That's, that fixed wing training, though, that I got saved my life in two instances. One, uh, I had a Alaskan bush pilot as one of my instructors, and he taught me how to circle down, spiral down through a hole in the cloud cover. And I had to do that over Benoit. Uh, <clears throat> there was another ship from our sled unit, Little Bears. He'd been up 15 minutes longer than me, and he was about out of fuel. And uh, I, so I told him I'm going in, and I, I said, you have me? He said, yeah. And so I went on down, and he said, oh, I've lost a hole. So I shined my landing light straight up, and he, he saw the light, you know, and it came on down. So we were refueling, and he came over and motioned to me. He said, I climbed down, and uh, so I went down. He gave me a big bear hug. He said, you <laughs> saved my bacon. <laughs> And uh, what was the other one? I forget. I'll think of it. <laughs> Questions? How did you guys navigate over the jungle? You didn't have any landmarks. You didn't have any visual references. How did you know where you were? Maps. That's it. Finger on a map and you don't lose it because if you did, you're a dead duck. <laughs> yeah, it's dead reckoning. Plus, I got to fly slicks the first two months and we did what's called ash and crash mission put us all out to all the fire support bases and we got really familiar with the area we operated in. I could almost go directly there with four digit coordinates. And I had a good memory back then, it wouldn't work for the hoot now. <laughs> also, that with the unit that you were going to support, uh, you could get on there radio frequency and you could monitor it on the instrument you had in the aircraft. Oh, <laughs> Did you have traffic controllers that could, could uh, help you? Not out there. <laughs> Only if you were over an Air Force base. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or if you had, uh, to the gentleman, I want to introduce you back here to the back, Bob uh, Carter, the O2s. He, uh, he could trap you. Yeah, I meant to add that uh, Slick and I both were trying to get a ground control approach because the fog had socked in across the whole country almost in a, few, you know, in a very few minutes. But the one at came in was broken, which it almost always was. So we flew down to get in range of Saigon, and he said, well, I might be able to get to you in an hour, and we didn't have that much fuel. So that's the reason I had to spiral down through the hole. They had dark humor in the Army. They had this, they needed at night traffic patterns out there when we could barely start flying solo. And on the downwind, that's out away from the, ru the runway had lights, but when you got away from the runway, there were really no lights. And some deep thinker asks his instructor, what happens if you're on downwind and the engine quits? And the guy says, put the collector down, enter our rotation, and close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it took him a while to think that that was not a good idea. <laughs> Questions out there? Yeah? 
I think this picture that you still have up is Mr. Reibold, and you mentioned Distinguished Flying Cross, and I'm curious if those are for collective achievement or a specific mission, or if that's a story that you can share. Well, they're, they're on specific days, of course, when you, you know, do something kind of stupid. <laughs> and, you know, they write it all down and it's submitted like any metal. And then somebody decides, I don't know who, but somebody decides, yeah, and, and then they award you that. But it's, I think the first one, uh, we had, uh, I, was, I was wounded during the first one. We were out on the flying the scout missions. And the second one was probably during Tad Offensive. I was in the first cab and, and we had moved from Central Highlands up to the DMZ. And that's where most of the North Vietnamese troops came across. And so uh, I think People got shot down, and you know, I was just doing whatever you need to do, and you know, saving somebody else. And the third one was, I can't remember that to tell you the truth, but it may have been the, the first cab moved around a lot. So after Tet Offensive, we went to Quezon, where the Marines were about to be totally overrun up there. And they moved the battalion up there. And then, then after that, we got done with that. Then we went to the Ashaw Valley. I think it was out in the Ashaw Valley, which all the Americans had been killed two years before. And they wanted us to go take that again. And I, it may have been when we had I was flying Huey then, and uh, which was command and control. It had the infantry battalion commander in there, and he has um, he has a, his own personal Huey whenever he wants it. And we used to stay with them and stay with the infantry units in a tent. Well, my whole year in Vietnam was in a tent, mm -hmm. but. I think it's when we had one of the scouts uh, got shot down and I went in there trying to see if they were still alive and that they, they weren't burning and anyway, that was the third one as I remember. I don't remember the third one too much. Mm -hmm. Question? Uh, what kind of altitudes did you generally fly? Well. Uh, with the command and control, you could get some altitude, but like I said, as a scout pilot, we'd be, if you guys were all trees, if we went up the ceiling, that would be high. And, and the purpose of that was when you, when you went to uh, find somebody, we'd fly as fast as we would go and circle around if we saw somebody running, you know, we'd take care of them. But a lot of times you, you didn't see anybody. And then you just continue to slow down and slow down. And saw somebody, but it was uh, if somebody shoots at you and they have any trees around or anything like that, if you're low to the trees, they can't get on you very quick. So, which is a good thing. <laughs> but sometimes, you know, they still find you. We here in Fleur. When we're going from one location to another, that's a slip. Now, around 1,500 feet, mm -hmm. that was out of the range of most of the weapons that they had, or safer anyway. Uh, what kind of air speeds were you flying? How fast were you flying? 80 knots most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, on the smoker missions, where we had to lay smoke along the tree lines, I tried to get it up to 100, but the Huey didn't like 100. It, got a one-to-one -one vibration, usually. Even if the blades were tracked right, it's not, not pretty at 100. Buddy? I have a question for you. If you uh, 
when you're newly formed pilots, you're newly hatched from, from uh, on the state, how do they acclimate you to combat conditions? Is there a <laughs> process that you go through? Oh, yeah, through? tomorrow morning. We'll see you. <laughs> <laughs> they literally throw you into a... Yeah, I climb in, you climb in the front seat of a snake, and you got your map, and uh, they put you in a, a wing aircraft because they can't count on you not to get lost. And then the, you follow the lead, and they turn your gun on, and he tells you not to shoot anything he doesn't tell you to shoot at, and that's the mission. I was fortunate after flight school that I got assigned to Fort Carson, Colorado, to the uh, medical detachment out there. And uh, what we did, uh, hunters go out there and have heart attacks up the mountains, so we got to fly in the mountains. And then uh, in, uh, oh, I think it was October or whatever, the, or November, we flew from Fort Carson to Chicago for the Democratic, 68th Democratic Convention. Uh -huh. So we got cross country experience and things of that nature. Thank you, John. <laughs> 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 Skip, did you follow the highway to get there? Or did you have a uh, five or a certain pattern? Uh, it's cross country, and we uh, we could only fly about two hours without refueling. Oh yeah. So we tried to uh, hit the uh, any Air Force base that had uh, fuel. Fuel, and then we spent the night. And I forget some one Air Force base out there, and uh, the reason I remember is Air Force base they had the top machines. And and so Papa had beer in there, so you could pull the beer out of the pot. Yeah. <laughs> Quarter. Mine was a little different. They put me with a experienced aircraft commander, and uh, <clears throat> I learned a lot from them. <clears throat> but then for gunships, I had one hour of OJT, and then I was in charge of the team. <laughs> What's OJT? On the job training. No. <laughs> Usually in our unit, they because uh, we had H-13s, the little scout helicopter, and Hueys. So they put you in when you go first got there. They put you in as a co-pilot, but uh, for a on couple Huey? months on a Huey, on a Huey, because you're single pilot in an H-13. Well, so but they had lost extra pilots, and in the 13th, so they didn't have enough scout pilots. So three of us came in at the same time, all from my flight class, and so the major was asking us what we want to do, and so I said, you know, whatever, you know, I'll do whatever you want. So he put the other two guys as co-pilots at the Huey, and I went right into scout. <coughs> but I flew wingman. Is the last time you said that? I bet. <laughs> <laughs> so you were qualified to fly any of the helicopters there? Well, right. back, well, no. We, we were all qualified to fly Hueys when we got out of flight school. But then any other aircraft, in those days, you had um, in-unit, in-country uh, training. So you'd fly with the co-pilot for a while, and then he'd sign you off as being okay to fly that. So, and so, I was, uh, when I got to Nam, I did some port marches and things like that and flew very little the first two months. Quick marshals. <laughs> because I had, hanging around me. <laughs> but because I had flown the stateside at high altitudes, I had to develop my touch, as we call it. And uh, shortly thereafter, I became the uh, SI uh, sanitation pilot, which gave check rides to every 90 days to the uh, regular pilots, and I flew with every new pilot that came in to come to, into the company and uh, to get them oriented and that type of thing. So you had an uh, orientation process in your unit? Yes. Any questions out there? Something just off the wall happened. <laughs> That's hilarious. You really want me to tell this? Huh? <laughs> hey, we love here. We like your stories. We, I was a select our company flew off two core. We were could be anywhere two core. Uh, we could haul uh, ranking officers, uh, donut dollies, hot meal, 
to the field, to the troops, and uh, we supported uh, American troops, uh, Vietnamese, Korean, Special Forces, whoever. One of the uh, things that I got involved with, we were hauling uh, pigs and chickens for the Vietnamese. <laughs> so, uh, trying to keep uh, pigs and chickens into an aircraft. Well, mine was, uh, we got scrambled, actually, my favorite wingman was out flying our OH-23, and uh, he was right up by the Nui Ba Din, it's an old dead volcano, I call it a pile of igneous rock, but uh, anyway, he'd received some fire, so he, my team was scrambled, and we got up there, and he, he thought they were VC, but as the people were coming out of the woods, they looked like forced labor types to me, as I didn't see any weapons, so mm -hmm. we circled them. Uh, and started moving them down to an old abandoned airfield. And, you know, the young guy would try to dart out and get away from the group, and my door gunner and crew chief took care of that. He put a little encouraging fire to the outside <laughs> of them. So we kept them together, and the whole time I'm on the radio to uh, Dow Chang Brigade Headquarters, saying you need to get somebody out here to question these people. This is 14 days before the Tet Offensive started, January 31st. So in the book, it's called Missed Intelligence. But anyway, we moved them all way down to the abandoned airfield and running low on fuel by then. So I sent my wingman over to Tain in to refuel, and uh, we landed. And of course, my my door gunner had the M60 uh, sort of not pointed at him, but at least in the general direction. And, and uh, he was starting to get hot, so he took his helmet off and set it down beside him. And uh, this lady was standing next to a guy with a hat on, and she whacked him a couple of times and told him to take his hat off because she was trying to show some respect, you know, to the guy with the big gun. <laughs> <laughs> well, a little later on, uh, an older gal had a big scowl on her face, and uh, we figured out why pretty quick. She had to relieve herself right there in front of us, so we all got a laugh out of that. <laughs> Felt sorry for her, maybe a little bit. But anyway, they, they radioed and said, no, nah, we got nobody to come out, so let them go. Mm -hmm. So by then, I uh, refueled and uh, I said, are you sure about that? He said, Roger, we don't have anybody. So I got invited to the division debriefing that evening. I was the only first lieutenant in the room. Everybody was major up. And our general, General Burns, did the best job of chewing a guy out that I've ever seen. A brigade commander got raked over the coals in front of probably 200 officers. So, anyway, uh, fortunately, General Wayland was on the ball, and he noticed that his unit wasn't getting any contact out in the jungle areas where he'd been. So he encouraged Westmoreland to move a bunch of battalions down to Saigon, because they pretty well figured that that's where they were headed. And sure enough, and if he hadn't done that, and we didn't have the battalions ready to take on the, the North Vietnamese and the VC, we'd have been in a lot worse shape. We, we cleaned our clock pretty quick. You'll see there's a new uh, video program called the Unauthorized uh, History of the Vietnam War. It's on Fox Nation. And uh, it really does a good job of telling the truth about <laughs> Vietnam. If you watch the news through the Vietnam period, you didn't get the truth. You got a varnished uh, concept of what really took place. They said it was a draw, and it was either the or one of very few of the greatest military victories in the history of 
the U.S. military. Uh, the ratios were just out of sight. 17,000 North Vietnamese and Viet Cong killed in the first three days. 258 Americans, and there were quite a few more South Vietnamese, but it was a total one-sided victory. So, if you want the truth, watch that. I'll just put it that way. It lines up with what my book says, because I researched it too. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, when you guys were over there, were you guys um, ever able to um, be aware of what was going on in, uh, in the United States at the time you guys were fighting, whether it was uh, the Kennedy assassination or civil rights or uh, the riots? And stuff? Yeah, we got the news one day late. By the time I got there, maybe Phil's time they did. We had TV. So the day after the show, they put it on tape and bring it back, bring it over there. So we saw it. I didn't. I didn't have a TV. <laughs> I, lived, I lived in a thatched roof pooch, though. I was better off than a tent. Yeah. We didn't have electricity in our tent, so we didn't have much of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So we didn't have any electricity. <laughs> Whenever they mortared the place, though, guys with TV that got busted because the concussion would break the tube. Yeah. <laughs> so we'd all go to the PX and get that. Yeah, if you were taping, which we did a lot, we were. We all bought stereo gear, PX, because it was cheap and popular thing to do. So we taped each other's records and things, and when order around it hit, be a big blank spot in the tape. Any questions? How would each of you rate the accuracy of the movies? Which movie? Any of them. Put them. Uh, are there any movies that, that ring particularly true? Platoon was made up as far as the rivalry between a bad sergeant and a good one. That was all made up. Stone Stone actually served in the 25th Infantry Division. And that battle that's portrayed near the end of it, uh, it was pretty real. And uh, it was a bad one. We a gunship from the Tain End unit was shot down and uh, you know that part was true some of the battle scenes were true but he had to add all that drama in there the only real good one was uh, we were soldiers and young that was accurate and that's because <coughs> the colonel insisted on it you know they Hollywood would try to run off and do something stupid and you wouldn't have it Colonel Moore because he, he made that agreement right up front, you're not going to make this into a Hollywood thing. So that that was a true, I thought, a true story. Wasn't that Crip First Cowboys? Yeah. That's what it felt Yeah. You weren't there in 65, though. That was the first real uh, vision of the North Vietnamese. They were portrayed coming out of Cambodia and uh, yeah, that's when they knew there were North Vietnamese. The CIA denied it for years after that. They said, there weren't any North Vietnamese. There are a lot of liars in this world, you know. <laughs> More than you can count. Have any of you been back to Vietnam? I did. In 73, I went back to an outfit called Air America. It was a civilian outfit that had contracts with the State Department and USA. Group. The U.S. went home in March of 73, but the U.S. civilian side of it was still there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Saigon was wide open. I had a villa because everything was so cheap that the U.S. went home. I had a general's villa. And uh, yeah, I lived there from 73, from January 73 to January 74. Mm -hmm. Did any of you go back as tourists after? The book references this, and <clears throat> I was wondering, has it been important to you to be involved with going to the reunions and uh, seeing guys that you serve with? I mean, has that been important? To you? 
We, the, my company, we have a reunion every two years. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, I forget what year we started it. It started out, there was only like 22 of us, and we met down the street board. And every two years, someone volunteered. We've been to Colorado Springs uh, two or three times, uh, Oklahoma City, Savannah, and Minneapolis. And last year, we were supposed to go to Vegas. But because of the virus, it was canceled. They're going to try to put it together this year, but I think because of the cost and everything, there won't be very many attend. But it's, uh, it's been very uh, helpful to meet up with the guys. Uh, we had some that was apprehensive about coming because of uh, memories. And once they were there, uh, we were extremely glad they came and talked and uh, with the people they had been around for a year. Yeah, the book talks about that. And so then it wound up helpful to yes. us there, right? Yeah, that's good. Uh, we have had two unit reunions, and I've been to two uh, Vietnam Helicopter Pilot Association reunions. That's pretty big, isn't it? That's big. Yeah. I think we, we went to one, and, uh, well, I was the oldest guy there. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the people there, you know, were there after me. I did find a wingman, though, and we flew a lot together, and he was there. We had a good visit. Nelson, you had a question? Well, I'll, I'll stand up, but as one of the ground people you supported, I thank each and every one of you. <laughs> and I know, Shorty, if we didn't have mechanics over there taking care of stuff, we wouldn't have got anything done. <laughs> but, but I do appreciate it. While I was there, I was an air mobile, not airborne in the 101st and I Corps, and I flew in a Huey or a Loach every single day. I was forward support, so I was in those things every day. There's, and then I'd say, well, I'm, I'm a pilot back in the States. Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> now you're an infantry officer. You've got to take care of you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Floor of Horn once uh, at Fort Walters over the gate. Uh, they, it says, across this path walks the greatest helicopter pilots in the world, mm -hmm. and that was true. We had good training. I'll say that I've never had training in engineering or anything else that was as thorough as the training as a, for helicopter pilots. Mm -hmm. One closing comment here. Uh, we saw a lot of young boys come out of uh, flight school, when they come from flight school right straight to Vietnam, young boys, I'm saying 18, 19, 20 years old. In a short period of time, a, very, a few months, they became young men. Mm -hmm. And a uh, lot of respect for those young people. Yeah, me too. The warrants were great. For the most part, some of them didn't listen, but, you know, you've got that everywhere. <laughs> I quite agree with that. <laughs> the hour is coming to a close, but we may want to squeeze in a few more questions. Yes. My question is for Shorty. Did you have parts shortages or were you well supplied? I mean, in maintenance and aviation, you've got a lot of specialty stuff. I don't ever remember having a write-up, say, on instruments or, or parts of the engines or anything. I don't ever remember them not having the part. Wow. But we're talking back in 1959, 60, 61. We just took him off other aircraft if we needed it. <laughs> <laughs> Supply sergeants were all good at midnight requisitions. That's what we call that. <laughs> I mean, we just did it. I don't know if it was illegal. We had to have X amount of aircraft up every day, and if everybody was at lunch, you went to some other unit's aircraft and took them. <laughs>
Well, they were at lunch. <laughs> One time I, we, I had an extra duty, we flew and then had an extra duty, whatever that was, and there might be documentation, but mine was a test fly of lunches. And they were always getting rotor blades shot out of them, and so you really touch fire them all the time. And so uh, finally, they needed, they figured they needed six aircraft up. We put four a day on two teams. But we needed six because a couple of them were going to get hit, maybe, you know. And so you needed available two back at the base. Well, we didn't have parts for these two aircraft. And the old man called me in the office. He never talked to me in my whole career. And this guy calls me in, he starts chewing on me, and he says, I need six of them. I said, what are you doing, telling me to steal parts? He said, oh, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> you know, like he had a career. He didn't want to lose that. So, but I stole the parts. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much.